A. E. C. H. You are the winner of the public giveaway. This might be the second time I'm recording this because I might have been an oopsie with the first one with the GoPro. But A E C H, you are the winner of the public giveaway for the MTG The Stack play mat. I'm gonna get in touch with you on Twitter through private DMs, just in order to like get all the logistics and the shipping and stuff sorted out. Uh, but congratulations, my dude. You are the man. But also, this would be the time that I would turn to Adrian. Except he left to go do other work stuff because he was already here to record this and my hand was on the mic the whole time. Ryan Colley, you are the Patreon winner of the... the <laughs> Ryan Colley, you are the Patreon winner of the MTG The Stack Playmat giveaway. We are also going to get in touch with you, but instead of over Twitter, we're going to get in touch with you over our Discord, which you can become a member of by also becoming a patron. Thank you. Can, Congratulations to the two of you. You get you get the you get the shiny play mat. I listen, man, I'm excited for this. Tiffany, are you excited? I'm so excited. T Tiffany really wants to eat food. There's the food. <laughs> and that was that listen, man. Mwah. Congratulations to you guys who won the mats. I believe it was. Oh, I can't even remember anymore. They recorded that a little bit ago. But you guys know now. Ryan Colley, I know you're the patron that wound up winning. Anyway, um, that's out of the way. We've done the giveaway. You guys know. You'll be hearing. You guys should reach out to us, but also, like, we'll reach out to you, too, if we're able to. We, we got to talk about logistics because we need, like, addresses and stuff. Anyway, now that that's out of the way, we've got some, yeah, EDH Commander gameplay for you guys today. And um, there's nothing super special about this game. Um, I guess I'll preface it with this is another Galazeth Prismari game. But this particular Galazeth Prismari deck is, this is going to be the only time you see this actual list because the original list was, like, from the um, Strixhaven, the big game we recorded um and that was a totally different list from the one i'm running now for real which is my cedh version of the list the the version i'm playing today is kind of in the between of the two it's like an optimized list i didn't really love how it performed at this power level i really wanted to take it up to cedh but if anyone's interested i think i will have the deck list for this video even though this is the only video that's going to have this particular uh, 99 for Galazeth. Anyway, that's everything anyone should need to know. So let's go ahead and take a look at who's playing, what decks they've decided to play, what opening hands they've decided to keep, as well as say it with me, our usual upkeep stuff. As always, if you like this show or any of our other shows on YouTube, liking, sharing, and subscribing helps us out immensely. If you like our content and don't mind that extra mile, you can always support us over on Patreon, over at patreon.com backslash MTG the stack. All I want you to say is, like the amazing Nazareel. Like the amazing Nazareel. Now look at the camera. You gotta maintain eye contact in order to get a good shot, okay? Next favor, take off the hoodie. Really take off all your clothes. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Comment down below any of your thoughts and feelings and we hope you enjoy the show. All right, first up, we've got me playing Galazeth Prismari, and this is gonna be a stacks build of the deck. For those of you who have been following the channel for the last couple of weeks, you'll notice that I've been playing this as a CEDH deck. This deck has a very similar play pattern as the CEDH version, where it wants to stacks the game out early and eventually win through Underworld Breach Brain Freeze combo. Although to be honest, this is probably the only time you're gonna see this version of the deck, as like I was saying, it's a CEDH build now. And I really think that this commander wants access to all of the powerful pieces we use in the CEDH format, in order to function properly. I had the mulligan down to six for my opening hand and I'll be keeping a ruby medallion, a chrome mox, static orb, mountain, an ancient tomb, a flooded strand, and I had to bottom a copy of river glide pathway. Next up we've got Calvin playing his most recent update to his Extus Orique overlord deck and no he has not changed it, it is in fact an awaken the blood avatar build. The deck wants to kind of act like a Mardu Aristocrats build in the early game, eventually leading up to casting the backside of Extus, Awaken the Blood Avatar, in hopes of winning the game through Brute Force. Calvin's keeping a 7 card hand with Nether Trader, Hero of Precinct 1, Anointed Procession, Imperial Recruiter, Costly Plunder, a Battlefield Forge, and a Windswept Heath. Next up, we've got Aiden playing a throwback to one of our set release videos, this one being from Commander Legends. It's the partner pairing of Kamal, Heart of Croza, and Jeska Thrice Reborn. This deck is simply an aggressive elf ball deck that gets to play red, have a board wipe out of the command zone, and an infinite mana outlet out of the command zone, while constantly threatening lethal with Kamal's activated ability. Aiden's also keeping a seven card hand with the Lamor Elves, a Sylvan Safekeeper, Reclamation Sage, Vorinclix Voice of Hunger, 
Spire Garden, Grove of the Burn Willows, and a Misty Rainforest. Finally, we've got Max returning to the channel with his Dina Soul Steeper build, and this is going to be a mid-range combo deck that wants to use the early game in order to make land drops, and he even plays some synergies that will gain him life, triggering his Dina. And in the late game, he wants to try to win with either Witherbloom Apprentice or Professor Onyx, in conjunction with either Chain of Smog or an indestructible permanent like Darksteel Citadel and Chain of Acid. Max also gets to keep a 7-card hand with an Eternal Witness, a Scoot Swarm, Courser of Crufix, Jedi Offshoot, Caustic Caterpillar, a Basic Forest, and a Basic Swamp. Okay. Alright, Calvin. Oh, wait, Max. Fuck you. Give it Card game. Me. Give the good one a. Yeah, I Come on. You moved it. Give me the right back to where give I had the good one. Give me the good one. Right I thought to give me a take. Better. I am the word. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay. I believe it is. Which one of these did you want? It was one that I, 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 never, I never pick one. I just let everyone else take them for That's me. That's fair. You have here to do that. One, two, three, go. Right. It's me. I'm first. <laughs> All right. I won card game, so I'll start off by drawing a card for turn. And then in my first main phase, I'll play Ancient Tomb. And then I'm going to type Ancient Tomb for two, losing two life. And I'll drop a Ruby Medallion. With nothing else, I'll just pass the turn to Calvin, who will untap, upkeep, draw his card for turn. Then I'll drop a Windswept Heath as his land for turn, and pass over to Aiden, who's going to draw his card for turn. Then he's going to drop a Spire Garden, comes into play untapped, so we'll tap it for a green and play a Soul Ring. After that, we'll pass to Max, who draws. In his first main phase, he's going to drop his own Basic Forest. Then he's going to tap for one and cast a Jedi Offshoot and just pass to me. I'll untap, upkeep, draw my card for turn, and then starting the second cycle of turns, I'll play a Basic Mountain as my land for turn. I'll lose two life, tapping for three, and then I'm gonna cast a Static Orb. So now as long as it's untapped, no one can untap more than two permanents on their untap steps. I'll try to pass the turn to Calvin, but before I can, he's gonna fetch for a Plains, dropping down to 39. And then we apparently make some kind of a Blood Pact here, and then he's gonna draw his card for turn. In his first main phase, he'll just drop a Basic Swamp as his land for turn. Then he'll tap for two and cast Hero of Precinct 1. With no further actions, he'll pass to Aiden, who untaps and draws his card. Then in his first main phase, he'll play Grove of the Burn Willows. Then he's going to tap out for four mana, and one of those cards was Grove, so I'll gain a life to it. And he's going to cast Beast Whisperer, and with nothing else, he'll pass the turn to Max. Max will untap, draw his card for turn, and then in his first main phase, he'll play Temple of Malady tapped as his land for turn. This will have him scrying one, he's going to scry to the bottom, he gains a life off of a Jedi offshoot. Then he's going to tap for one and cast Caustic Caterpillar, and with no further actions, we'll move to my turn for the third cycle of turns. I'll draw my card for turn and play a basic island as my land for turn. Then I'm going to tap for 4 mana, losing 2 life to my ancient tomb to cast my commander, Galazath Prismari. When I do this, I actually have a floating colorless mana because of the ruby medallion, but I don't wind up needing it, so I'll drop a treasure thanks to Galazath entering, and then I'm going to play a Chromox, but I won't imprint because Galazath's going to let me tap it for mana either way. After that, we'll go to Calvin's turn, he'll draw for turn and play a Battlefield Forge in his first main phase. Then he's going to tap for 3, using the forge for red so he drops down to 38 to cast Imperial Recruiter. When it enters play, it has an Enter the Battlefield trigger, so he searches his library for a Dockside Extortionist, puts it into his hand and passes to Aiden, who only untaps 2 permanents per my Static Orb, draws his card for turn, and then plays Misty Rainforest. Then he's going to straight away crack his Misty Rainforest, dropping to 39, and then he's going to search his library for a land, in this case he gets a Basic Forest, and puts it into play. Mm. Sylvan Savekeeper. Oh, Trigger? Yes, yes. Mm, oh, quite, yes. yes. Mm. Quite, yes. Mm. One more else? Mm, all of a sudden, I'm not the problem mm, anymore. Trigger, mm, yes. yes. Now yeah. I'm the good guy holding out his mana mm. mm. After drawing his card to the Beast Whisperer, he'll pass the turn to Max, who will draw his card for turn, and then he's going to play a basic Swamp as his land for turn, gaining a life off of the Jedi Offshoot. With no further actions, he'll try to pass the turn to me, but first I tap my artifacts for mana per Galazath and cast Factor Fiction. That'll have me looking at the top 5 cards in my library, passing them to an opponent, in this case Aiden. He'll make 2 piles, I'll pick 1 pile to go to my hand, and the other to go to the graveyard. It ends up being 4 lands and a Prismari Command, so he separates it as Mountain Prismari Command, and then 3 in the other, so I obviously take Prismari Command and Mountain into my hand, and bin everything else. After that, I'll untap, draw my card for turn, and then in my first main phase, I'm going to play a basic island as my land for turn. After that, I'm going to tap some of my artifacts for mana, in this case blue and red, in order to cast Prismari Command. It costs one less thanks to the Ruby Medallion, and I'll choose to deal two damage to Hero of Precinct 1 and draw two cards, and then discard two cards. In this case, I get rid of two basic lands. After that, I'll tap for two mana, and I'm going to cast an Arcane Signet, and with no further actions, I'm just going to pass the turn back to Calvin. Calvin's going to untap, upkeep, draw his card for turn, and then in his first main phase, he'll play a Boros Garrison, that triggers so he has to bounce a Plains back to his hand, 
and with nothing else, he'll just pass the turn to Aiden. Aiden's going to draw for turn, and then drop a basic mountain as his land for turn. Then he's going to tap for 3 mana, and it's going to be so he can cast a Reclamation Sage. When he casts it, it's going to trigger his Beast Whisperer, and he's going to draw a card. Then he'll resolve its ETB, destroying my Medallion, forcing Max to deal with my Static Orb. After that, he's going to go to combat and attack Calvin for 2 with his Beast Whisperer. Calvin doesn't want to block here, so he drops to 36. And then, at Aiden's end step, Max will in fact deal with my Static Orb by sacrificing his Caustic Caterpillar, so I'll put it in the bin. After that, we'll just move to Max's turn, where he untaps and draws his card for turn. Then in his first main phase, he'll tap out and cast Course of Crufix. He'll reveal the top card of his library, which is in fact a land, so he gets to play it off the top, and it's going to be a basic forest. That triggers the Courser and the offshoot, so he gains 2 life and goes to 44, and reveals Escape Shift off of the top, and just passes the turn to me. I'll untap, and then I'll play a Flooded Strand as my land for turn, and I decide I don't want to take any action, so I'll pass to Calvin, who will untap, draw, play a Graven Karens as his land for turn. Then he taps for 4 mana, and he wants to cast one of the best cards in his deck, Anointed Procession. That's going to wind up resolving, so he tries to pass the turn to Aiden, but Aiden has a response. He wants to tap for 3 mana, and cast Beast Within, targeting Calvin's Anointed Procession. This resolves, so Procession hits the bin, then Calvin's going to make a 3-3 Beast thanks to the Beast Within, then Aiden will untap, and draw his card for turn. In Aiden's first main phase, he'll play a basic Forest as his land for turn, then he's going to count out and tap 8 mana, and he's going to wind up playing Vornclick's Voice of Hunger. Alarmingly, none of us have any responses to this, so Max is going to untap, draw for turn, and reveal Abrupt Decay on the top of his deck thanks to the Courser. Then he'll tap for 2 and cast his commander Dina, and immediately drop a Swamp, which is going to gain him 2 life, and we'll each actually take 2 damage thanks to Dina's triggered abilities. Mind you that the D6 on his land is just to represent that those lands will not untap on his next untap thanks to the Vorin clicks. After that, Max wants to have some mana next turn, so he passes to me. Before he can, I'll fetch, search my library for a basic island, put it into play, and then we're going to go to my turn, so I'll untap, upkeep, and I'm going to draw my card for turn. In my first main phase, I'm going to tap for four, one's going to be floating, and it's going to be red. I'll lose two life, and I'm going to cast Frantic Search. Frantic Search is going to have me drawing two cards, and then I get to choose and discard two cards, and after I'm done with that, I get to untap three lands. So I now have one red floating. After that, I'm going to make a slight misplay. I'm going to use my floating red and tap my Chrome Box for mana, but I use it to cast Underworld Breach, which is not an instant or sorcery, but don't worry, it never comes close to mattering in this game at any point. Now that Breach is in play, I will tap for four and flashback Frantic Search. That's going to have me drawing two cards, discarding two cards, and untapping three lands. This is an interesting loop because I can keep paying for it as long as I have the life, and I always put two cards in the bin, which makes it easy to recast, but it's not infinite at this point. Every time I escape, I lose a card in the bin, and I'm only able to replace two. While I'm doing this, I get to float three mana thanks to my Ancient Tomb, which produces two mana on its own. So I'm going to use the three floating mana to cast Wheel of Misfortune, and we're all going to secretly choose a number. Max chooses 12, I choose 22, Calvin chooses 0, and Aiden chooses 13. So I'm going to wind up taking 22 damage and wheeling, and then everyone else but Calvin will also wheel. We'll discard our hands and each draw a fresh 7. I still haven't found what I'm looking for, so now I'm going to tap for 3, losing 2 life, and I will again escape Frantic Search, exiling 3 cards from my graveyard. Then, one of the cards that I discarded the Frantic Search winds up being Brain Freeze. Then I'm going to drop a Mox Opal, and you'll notice that we've started to pay attention to the Storm Count, and that's because there's a Brain Freeze in my graveyard now. What I'm going to do is use my Floating Mana, and then tap my Mox Opal to escape Brain Freeze from my graveyard by exiling 3 cards. When I cast this Brain Freeze, it winds up being the 8th spell cast this turn, so I'm going to mill myself for 3 8 separate times, and get access to a lot of my deck. Now here I would normally spin out and go infinite, but Max actually has a response before I can do anything else, and it's actually quite good against a lot of the counter magic I have sitting in my graveyard. He's going to tap for 2 mana and cast Abrupt Decay, targeting my Underworld Breach, but I do have a response. I'm going to tap for 2 mana of my own, using my Arcane Signet and my Treasure, and I'm going to cast Unsubstantiate, putting the Decay back in his hand, and he's down to 1 mana so he cannot recast it. After that, I'm going to start casting Brain Freeze from my graveyard, and I have gained access to my Lotus Petal. What this means is that I can start to escape my own Lotus Petal, fueling the escape by Brain Freezing myself incrementally here and there, and then once my Storm Count gets high enough, I can start to cast Brain Freeze out of my graveyard, putting all of the targets on each of my opponents, and if my graveyard gets too low, I can hit myself with one or two targets here or there to keep escaping the Brain Freeze and the Lotus Petal. What this means is my opponents are going to mill all of their libraries into their graveyards, and eventually, once I'm done, I just get to pass the turn, and all of my opponents lose when they try to draw a card and can't. If that was a little bit sloppy, you're going to have to forgive me. That was my first time actually trying to execute the Brain Freeze Breach combo, you know, under a camera. 
And to be honest, it's really kind of, it's so much more difficult to do it without Lion's Eye Diamond, which is one of the notable exclusions from this version of the deck. Let's go ahead and talk about how this game went, and I'd like to start with some of the more obvious people. I think the most obvious person to talk about really quick is just Calvin, because his deck did not really get its wheels spinning at all. He, um, he was kind of, he kept a very safe hand. He had the Imperial Recruiter, he was able to get Dockside Extortionist, which would have been insanely good against me because I had so many artifacts in play. But he, he never wound up getting to the point where he could cast it and um, go off with it, unfortunately. And the whole game kind of went underneath his Exodus game plan, unfortunately. And even when he cast Anointed Procession, which had the game gone a few turns longer, it would have been absolutely outstanding. Aiden decided to beast within the Anointed Procession, and I'm not sure if that was the correct choice. Um, in hindsight, maybe hit my Galazeth to slow me down a little bit. It probably would have put me off of going off for a whole turn, but at that point I did only have two cards in my hand. And I hadn't cast a spell for a turn or two at that point, so I don't think his threat assessment was off. I think it was just... It was interesting. There was an interesting point where you could have used this beast within on a few different things. And um, the Anointed Procession wasn't the worst option, although in hindsight, Galazeth would have been pretty good. But Calvin really didn't do a whole lot that game, unfortunately. Um, there were things that could have happened in a couple turns. We'll move on to, um, let's talk about Max, because uh, Max's deck kind of started to do what it was designed to do. It's a combo deck, but it wants to use Dina as a way to like grind incremental value and um, have a free sack outlet, which can be good for some of the lines in the deck. But the big thing that we never really saw start to happen at all was either Professor Onyx or Wither Bro Witherbloom Apprentice. These are the cards that let them go off because they have Magecraft. So if you can do something like cast a Chain of Smog, targeting yourself, and then continue to chain a smog over and over by discarding, mind rotting yourself, discard two cards. Um, you get infinite mag magecraft triggers and everyone just dies. He didn't really get there. I'm excited to see more Dina. This list looks really cool. I would recommend checking out the deck list in the description if you want to see some of the cool tech that he put into the deck itself. Aiden was like a turn away from killing somebody, maybe two people. He had the Voren clicks, so if I hadn't won there, we would have all started to fall behind very quickly thanks to the Voren clicks itself because we use our mana, then we don't get our mana. He has double mana and he has an insane mana sink in his command zone that his name's Kamal. Um, I think he, what he would have done first had he lived another turn was killed me promptly. I don't think I would have made it through another turn, which is why I went off there more on that in a second. And then um, his game plan was just executed very well. He went dork into like a Beast Whisperer and he, he held back his Sylvan Safekeeper to trigger the Beast Whisperer. He Reclamation Sage my Ruby Medallion and it made more sense to hit the um, Static Orb, but he knew that Max would need to hit that Static Orb if he wanted to keep playing the game. So it was just kind of like, we're gonna deal with both of them, but I'm gonna deal with the Ruby Medallion first to like kind of force your hand on using your Caustic Caterpillar. He played it really well, and um, the only problem that he ran into is my deck was a turn faster that game. That was really it. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to wrap it up because I think it was on turn six. I was forced to go for it. I, normally, I would wait a little bit longer because it wasn't a sure thing, but because I knew I was dead to Aiden if I passed the turn, I had to go for it. It wound up paying off. Um, it was a sloppier way to execute the combo because with Lotus Petal, you have to go through so many extra steps to make sure you can actually execute the brain freeze because you need to make mana. LED makes it much, much easier to make the correct amount of mana. We got there. It was good. The, my game was actually kind of insane. I led on an Ancient Tomb into a Ruby Medallion, which set me up for like, I was just super mana efficient for the first like three, four turns. And then um, there was a turn where I just passed the turn and didn't do anything. I don't even know if I did anything with my mana on that turn. All that really matters is uh, on my sixth turn, I just went off. No one could really stop me. The abrupt decay was common knowledge, um, which was actually a fumble on my part. I didn't actually know I was going to get access to the unsubstantiate. Lucky for me, I got the unsubstantiate, which in this current list is the only way I can deal with the abrupt decay. It's not like I'm playing Time Twister and can shuffle the uh, breach back into my library, which is what my current CDH deck version of the deck is doing. But yeah, it was a sweet game. Um, it was a little bit quick, but I think that's fine for, you know, a normal Wednesday upload. And um, you guys probably noticed we've ramped up the upload schedule a little bit. There's a reason for that. And there's more information coming on like you know what, what is the um you know is there a schedule to the uploads the short answer is yes but for now just enjoy more videos um because we need to get into a rhythm before we like tell you guys on these days this type of video is going up i hope that makes sense anyway that's all i have for you guys today thank you so much for watching and as always i'll see you next time